Okay, welcome everybody. My name is Tamar Friedman and on behalf of Jewish Funders Network, I want to welcome you today for a very interesting webinar on how has Israel's political stalemate come to an end. We're very fortunate today to be able to hear from Yochanan Plesner, the president of the Israel Democracy Institute and Professor Tamar Herman, who's the director of the Gutman Center for Public Opinion at the IDI. And they're gonna talk about uh, what's been going on, what the stalemate has, has led to different issues in Israel with also the coronavirus has hit Israel in the midst of such a major political and constitutional crisis. And what does, this, what does the Israeli public think about these latest developments? And will they bring Israel's warring political parties together? And we're very fortunate to have a partnership with the IDI. And we've heard from Yochanan many times in the last I guess year, year and a half and beyond, I believe as well on webinar and at our conference. So we, I wanna say thank you again for that partnership of continuing to bring this relevant and timely information to JFN members. And just um, a logistical uh, note is that the Q&A box on the bottom of your screen is open the whole time during the webinar. Please, as you have questions, type them in and we were gonna have ample time at the end to ask the presenters different, different questions that you may how you may be thinking about as you hear the presentations. So with that, um, I will pass it over to Yochanan. Thank you, Yochanan. Hi, uh, good evening from uh, Israel. I guess it's uh, around uh, lunchtime in, the, in North America. Uh, and again, uh, thanks for having uh, both of us. Uh, we're, we're speaking today at a moment where there is a severe economic crisis. We're hopefully at the end of a political slash constitutional crisis uh, and, and there's a health crisis that has to do with corona and obviously all of these uh, events are interlinked and, and affect each other. So I'll start briefly with uh, uh, and, and major decisions are being taken. The Supreme Court made a big decision uh, last night. Uh, the president just a few minutes ago assigned Mr. Netanyahu with the task of forming uh, a government. So things are, are actually happening and, and shaping up. I'll start briefly with the uh, a corona st a status and then move to the uh, political uh, constitutional status and what can we expect of uh, uh, perhaps the government that will be established and sworn in uh, uh, next uh, Wednesday, uh, presumably. So uh, uh, corona-wise, um, well, we're beginning a new phase in Israel. When, and when we last met them, we chatted before, it was just when the, the crisis, uh, 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 um, the severe part of the crisis began mid-March. Now we're uh, beginning to step out of it in Israel. And most businesses are allowed to open. Schools are slowly uh, reopening. Kindergartens are beginning to open up uh, and, and next week. So, uh, and, and the economy uh, begins to roll back. Health-wise, it seems like we dodged the bullet. Uh, low uh, death rates, uh, one of the lowest uh, in the developed world altogether, uh, uh, 200 and something, around 240 deaths, and, and the hospitals were never close uh, to collapsing or, not, or to not being able to um, deal with the, uh, with the, uh, with the pressure. Uh, so this is the health aspect, which is by and large good news. Economically, though, uh, the situation is very dire. Uh, we are at 27.4% unemployment, up from uh, a mere 3.6% in the beginning of March. So, so it's, a, it's a dramatic rise from one of the lowest levels of unemployment in our history just two months ago uh, uh, to probably the highest level of unemployment in our history. And it's unclear, although we're being to open up in a sort of uh, a corona pandemic mode, uh, it's unclear uh, uh, how many uh, of our employees will return uh, 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 to work. Uh, entire industries are still either shut or very closed uh, or very slow, like tourism, culture, uh, leisure. Uh, and many of those who were uh, thrown out of the workforce are the younger, under 35, uh, more women than men, and, and lower uh, 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 average wages are less than uh, uh, less than the average. So it's the sort of 
the weaker echelons of society were those that are uh, harder hit by the crisis. Uh, our economists at IDI uh, uh, they predicted that uh, uh, by the end of 2020, uh, we can expect unempl the unemployment level to drop down to 11.5%, which is much less than 27, but it's as, 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 as high as we had in our uh, deepest slumps in Eastern history. Uh, it's even higher than what we had during the second intifada or in other economic recessions. So it's a, it's a, we're entering a difficult period and, and, and Professor Tamar Herman that will uh, 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 share her comments after me, uh, will share with us the public opinion uh, uh, implications and aspects of, of the crisis and obviously how it, uh, it closely affects our, our, uh, our uh, politics and, the, and the developments in the public sphere. So moving away from the uh, uh, corona uh, uh, to our politics, both uh, 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 parties today are actually 72 members of Knesset, including blue and white uh, members of Knesset, signed the letter to President Rivlin asking him uh, to assign Mr. Netanyahu the role of uh, forming a government. And just minutes ago, uh, less than an hour ago, um, President Rivlin assigned uh, Mr. Netanyahu, gave Mr. Netanyahu 14 days uh, to form a government. Blue and White obviously signed uh, uh, that uh, uh, request after agreeing, after reaching a coalition, a political agreement between Likud and Blue and White for forming a government. And they created the, uh, they passed legislation in the Knesset to uh, basically make the necessary changes in our uh, uh, constitutional changes to allow for this uh, new creation of a bi-headed government, a government that has, to some extent, two heads, two prime ministers, a prime minister and a designated uh, prime minister or an alternative prime minister, both of which have together the authority of determining the government agenda and, and basically have absolute veto power on the government's agenda, decision, legislation. Uh, so that's a new kind of uh, uh, constitutional animal, if you will, some say, some say, some even say monster, um, and, but it's, it's a new, uh, it's a new uh, hybrid uh, uh, government. And uh, the Supreme Court last night uh, 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 decided not to intervene in the legislation so far, the legislation that enabled that uh, agreement to be implemented. Um, so uh, while Mr. Netanyahu received the mandate and there's a signed coalition agreement, we expect he, he agreed with Mr. Gantz to present the government next Wednesday um, to, uh, and, and for the Knesset to, to vote confidence in that new government. If that indeed happens, this will uh, formally end uh, a year and a half long, the longest political crisis and constitutional crisis in our country's 72-year uh, history. A uh, crisis that included three election campaigns and, and, and a caretaker government uh, uh, managing the affairs of state with uh, limited authorities, no budget, uh, no nominations, and, and basically uh, uh, decision making at the national level uh, 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 in many ways was uh, halted. And this, this will end, and this is uh, uh, in this respect good news. The Supreme Court's decision. Uh, the Supreme Court was asked to intervene uh, uh, this week in, in, there were two major petitions. One had to do, one was against an indicted prime minister forming a government. And the Supreme Court with a, a decision of 11 judges uh, uh, versus zero ruled that it is legal for, a, 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 for an indicted prime minister uh, uh, to form a government or that, that there's no a ground for an intervention on their behalf to uh, in, in the judgment of the members of Knesset who decided to assign Netanyahu, the 61 uh, or 72 in this case, members of Knesset that decided to assign Netanyahu the mandate. Uh, the Supreme Court uh, though did not, decided that it, it's premature to discuss uh, and, and, and they might revisit later the laws uh, that are uh, uh, were uh, that are being passed in order to allow for this government to be created, uh, so it includes the idea of dual prime ministers, 
what was labeled the staggered Norwegian law or some awkward arrangement that uh, allows uh, blue and white members of Knesset to enter into parliament uh, if blue and white ministers resign in a way that uh, skews the political process. This probably after uh, the criticism from the court, this probably will not be submitted this legislation. And there's questions about shortening the Knesset's term and about um, uh, violating uh, past norms in the election, in the committee that elects uh, judges. So all of those issues that I just mentioned, the court said, it's not the time for us to intervene. So in the main decision, whether Netanyahu can form a government, the court permitted it. In the other areas, they decided not to intervene. Supposedly in the uh, coalition agreement, uh, it stipulates that if the court intervenes in any elements of the agreement, it's, uh, it, it provides grounds for Likud and Netanyahu to pull out of the agreement and, and call for an early election. So while if the government will be sworn in next week, we can say it's an end to the crisis, uh, we're still not in a safe, stable ground where we can say, well, there's a government in high likelihood for three or four years, but rather we have to see the first few months, for sure half a year, uh, to be sure that uh, uh, this government is actually uh, uh, launched itself on a, on a on a reasonable uh, functional trajectory. Um, and we have to be responsible and say that there's still the option of Mr. Netanyahu deciding not to uh, uh, swear in his government in, in next Wednesday to find some kind of excuse or reason. Uh, he'll probably look at the polls and, and examine his situation. Tamar will uh, uh, share with us what's his situation right now as the, as the sort of executive uh, a, 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 a manager in chief of the corona crisis. Um, so far, the public initially gave him better results, now a little uh, worse, but generally his, his numbers are okay and he might be tempted to go for a fourth election. So I wouldn't rule out any option. Although we know generally that the government, that the public is, 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 uh, is very much interested in the end of the political crisis. And, and, and generally supports that new government with all of the, although it, it's, it, it's uh, saturated with the oddities and, and awkward, uh, 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 awkward arrangements. So why did both sides agree on that agreement? Both sides gave up on a lot. Netanyahu is giving up presumably on an option of a fourth election and ruling afterwards on his own. Gantz gave up on his main campaign pledge not to serve under an indicted prime minister. Uh, uh, so both uh, gave up on a lot, probably uh, Gantz gave up. Actually, you know, Netanyahu is uh, sharing power with Gantz in a very significant manner. Uh, the government, uh, is, the, the portfolios are allocated uh, on, a, on a basis of parity and, uh, and with absolute mutual uh, veto power. Uh, uh, so that's something that Netanyahu gave up and Gantz gave up. The whole notion that he, for half half of the Israeli public, he served as the promise and the hope for uh, replacing Mr. Netanyahu. So uh, why did they do it? Well, the Corona crisis obviously uh, uh, it pushed them uh, together. Uh, an interim government could not pass budgets that are needed to provide relief. Uh, the public had less appetite. Uh, uh, for such a crisis and, and perhaps would have uh, exacted the political price on whoever would have been perceived as dragging on this crisis uh, unnecessarily. And, uh, and it was perceived by many, both by Netanyahu and Gantz, but by many in the public also as a lesser of, uh, of uh, evils. Netanyahu is somehow gaining legitimacy uh, for his rule under an indictment, but is not gaining control over the justice ministry and law enforcement agencies uh, and in this respect, he's not fulfilling his dream. Gantz, on the other hand, uh, ensures that the trial will begin on time. Um, his candidate will nominate. Netanyahu will have some sort of a, a, a veto, but essentially his candidate for justice minister will lead the process of selecting the next state prosecutor uh, within a year, the next attorney general, and so on. So, so in, in this respect, it's some kind of a, I labeled it a democratic ceasefire. Uh, while the 
fight against corruption is being eroded, uh, the institutions of uh, uh, law enforcement institutions and the independent judiciary uh, can be protected. And the wave of anti-democratic legislation we've experienced is, uh, is, um, is uh, going, uh, is, is, uh, will be discontinued, which is uh, from uh, my vantage point, uh, uh, a serious uh, advantage. Gantz politically uh, felt, I think, that he maxed out and, and he tried three times and he achieved the highest uh, the, the election, the best election uh, outcome that he could have uh, hoped for. And uh, uh, he defined a, a more modest goal to defend Israel's democracy and to help end the uh, uh, political crisis. And there is some, in some likelihood, he might actually become prime minister in, in 18 months. and. Uh, and uh, and and for Mr. Uh, again for Mr. Netanyahu, uh, while his prospects of going for a fourth election look rather promising, uh, 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 it's a very volatile period with such high levels of unemployment, and uh, in in such a situation, you know how you enter an election campaign, but you have no clue how how you will come out of it. Finally. Assuming this government will be uh, uh, established, what can we expect uh, uh, from it? So I mentioned the democratic ceasefire, i.e. Israel will not be more liberal democratic in three years, but will also not be much less liberal democratic. It's, uh, it's uh, um, uh, uh, both sides are grabbing onto the throats of the other and, uh, and we expect some kind of a, a, a ceasefire in that area. Similarly, also in the area of religion and state. The ultra-Orthodox won't be able to advance a radical agenda in areas such as the markets bill, shutting down, uh, further shutting down transportation on Saturday. And, uh, but at the same time, we're not going to expect any new progress because they still have uh, a, a, a disproportionate power and, uh, and the alliance with Netanyahu is just as strong. So there's no, we, we, there's no quote unquote risk of any a reform that will liberalize uh, the rabbinate, uh, the rabbinate's uh, uh, monopoly over uh, 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 many aspects of our domestic affairs. The ultra-Orthodox also secured a win uh, that IDF recruitment policy uh, uh, will be uh, even uh, more uh, lax and, uh, and, uh, and, and basically the, uh, and the ability of the ultra-Orthodox to dodge military service will be further enhanced. So, and, and again, Kotel bill and such arrangements are not expected to, and we, we don't expect an improvement because the ultra-Orthodox hold on to their power. Uh, from a socioeconomic perspective, there's a broad parliamentary base that will provide a strong base for economic reforms. Should Netanyahu and Gantz decide to use this opportunity, they might use uh, uh, mutual veto power and, and decide uh, and paralyze each other and just agree on the bare minimum, but uh, since the economic issues in Israel are less of wedge issues than politically mobilizing issues, there is a massive opportunity here for government and governance a reform. At IDI, we hope to uh, push for that and help uh, support it, but uh, it will really depend also on the decisions of the political leaders to, to, to use this position and the opportunity of such a crisis. Uh, security, uh, uh, the same, by the way, it, you know, our minimum expectation is for a democratic ceasefire, but such a broad parliamentary base of a national unity government can be also used in order to agree on some, uh, on a broad consensus of, for changes in, 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 con in constitutional chapters uh, uh, to uh, stabilize uh, uh, some of the constitutional aspects of our institution. Uh, we're going to try to push for that and, and uh, and educate the leadership in this direction, uh, but ultimately, you know, they can again agree to not not to agree and to uh, settle for the lowest common denominator. Finally, security-wise, on the main questions of Iran, Hezbollah, Hamas, Syria, Gaza, uh, Lebanon, uh, the same. We expect the same line to continue. The defense establishment generally defines policy and calls the shots in those areas. Gantz will enter as defense minister, Ashkenazi as foreign minister. Uh, uh, we don't expect uh, any major changes. 
the, the change that uh, will take place is, is the, uh, 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 perhaps the um, uh, annexation. Uh, there's a window of opportunity in the agreement between July and October uh, before the US elections uh, for uh, Netanyahu uh, to try and, and bring forward uh, uh, via the Knesset, assuming Gantz will veto it in the government, uh, some form of annexation, whether symbolic, a modest idea or something broader, and uh, it depends on the administration, the US administration's approval. And there are many other caveats and barriers, uh, 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 but it will really depend, I guess, on uh, Netanyahu's domestic political calculations, whether he would want to instigate a crisis, whether he would want to work on some kind of a legacy in that area, and obviously on, on President Trump domestic political calculations before an election. So this uh, annexation issue is like a pistol that is uh, 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 put forward on the first part of the theatrical play. And uh, we still don't know if anyone will make use of it or not, but we will know within a few months. So uh, uh, I hope that uh, steered some uh, uh, initial thoughts and, and the rest we can uh, respond to the Q&A and now uh, Tamar uh, can uh, uh, complement those comments with the aspect of, of, uh, of uh, public opinion. So thank you. Good evening here, good afternoon to you there and I'll try to tell you a bit about Israeli public opinion which accounts to a large extent to the political move that uh, Yochanan just uh, described because uh, public opinion in Israel, as you probably know, um, people are highly politically oriented and opinionated. And uh, the way we are uh, doing surveys at the IDI, all politicians in Israel are also conducting uh, public opinion polls uh, and in a way, they try to figure out what does the public think about certain moves before they do it. So I'll share my screen with you and we'll go through three main issues. I'll talk about the background uh, of Israeli public opinion vis-a-vis -vis the political system. Then I'll talk about the corona crisis and its implications. And then I'll deal a bit with the Israeli relations with the Palestinians. And uh, at the very end, I'll give you some numbers regarding the support for uh, annexation. So here we go. Okay. So as I said, some background, triple crisis, Yohanan already talked about it, political, medical, and economic, social, uh, domestic implications of the pandemic, and uh, Israeli-Palestinian uh, relations. Now. This is uh, a very significant uh, uh, chart that you see here. We asked people how uh, optimistic or pessimistic uh, they are regarding the future of Israeli democratic regime and national security. When we started asking these two questions in April, their assessment was about the same level of optimism about the uh, Israeli democracy. It, just uh, uh, after the e elections. And then as you can see, the two lines are moving in different directions and the gap between them is growing. The upper line is always uh, optimism regarding national security. So from the security point of view, people are more relaxed and more uh, optimistic than on the issue of uh, the future of Israeli democracy. Here we went down to less than one third that were optimistic. Uh, since then, since November, we go a little bit higher than down again, and now it's 45%. Uh, percent. So as you can see, the two lines go uh, on different directions and uh, the uh, level of support and uh, optimism for uh, security is much higher than that on the democratic nature of Israel. Now, uh, we asked uh, um, to which extent the state of Israel ensures the security or the welfare of its citizens. As you can see, people are quite satisfied, the majority is satisfied with the security provided by the state. 
However, the majority is not satisfied with the welfare provided by the state, okay? And of course, under the uh, dismal situation of, of circumstances of the uh, corona pandemic, this number is growing higher than it used to be. But again, security is guaranteed. And by the way, this is why people are not ready to um, uh, expand the, the uh, uh, security budget because they say we have enough security, we are good with that. Put the money on welfare, okay? Now, here we go again to the issue of democracy and we ask uh, our respondents to say whether they agree or disagree with the statement, Israeli democracy is in great danger. And as you can see, the differences between the three main political blocks are enormous. We have a huge majority on the left, 80, almost 85% saying, yes, Israeli democracy is in great danger. At the center, two thirds, and on the right, only one third. When we uh, dig deeper into the differences, why do these people think that uh, Israel is in great danger? Normally the left would say because uh, the judicial system is being ground down by uh, the government, the administration, and, and so on and so forth. However, when we ask the, right, the people of the right, why do they think that the Israeli democracy is in great danger? They, uh, they tell us that the judicial system is too strong. So uh, these people and these people have very little in common. Certainly, they do not agree about the sources of the danger to the Israeli uh, democracy. And this is, by the way, why uh, a social protest on the left and social protest on the right will never uh, uh, struggle together in order to fix the system because they'd like to fix it in different directions. And we had some manifestations of public, uh, of, of public protest in the last couple of weeks. And we asked uh, a question, especially in an emergency situation like the present one, it's important to be on guard that the government doesn't exploit the crisis to harm democracy. And we had again, 80% of uh, those who identify themselves with the left and uh, half of those uh, identifying with the center said, yes, we should be on guard because uh, uh, democracy is in danger. Only 21% of the right said so. Now, uh, we ask people to which extent uh, uh, are they afraid of getting infected uh, with the uh, corona uh, um, uh, disease. And uh, we saw a, a short increase between February and uh, March. And then we saw a, a decline starting on the, at the end of March and even in April. The peak was at 75% uh, saying that they uh, were afraid. And then in two weeks, it went down to 61% and then to 52%, and we expect it to get even lower because uh, apparently the situation is less uh, uh, problematic than uh, people thought it would be. And then we asked about fear of the economic future, personal economic future, and this is what Yohanan uh, uh, spoke about. And uh, what we saw again, uh, the same, the same uh, issue, um, like uh, the fear uh, from getting infected. In uh, late March, 65% were uh, greatly or modestly afraid. Then it, uh, uh, it went up to 69% and then it went down again, 65%, 67%, 65%. And the day before yesterday, it was 53% uh, uh, only. So people are more relaxed uh, in general. We also asked about the general uh, um, pressure and we saw the same, the same uh, problem. Now, uh, normally uh, such situation as, uh, um, uh, as a, a pandemic, uh, people uh, tend to feel more part of uh, their surrounding because they're all under the same threat. And we asked, do you feel part of the state and its problems? And we indeed saw uh, that on the average, uh, the Jews, uh, the different uh, groups of, of the Jewish uh, public were all about 90% saying, yes, I feel part of the state, state and its 
its problems. And here we saw two um, interesting findings, uh, but it might be a one-off uh, measurement. We should see it in the future. Of the Israeli Arab uh, interviewees, 77% said that uh, uh, they uh, feel part of the state and its problems. In our previous measurements, it was always between 45 to 60 something, never 77. So either because of the uh, shared threats, they do feel more or felt more than in, in the past, or uh, that the process, and in a minute I'll, I'll, I'll talk about the relations between Jews and Arabs, maybe because of what happened during uh, the crisis, the health crisis, medical crisis, uh, we will have to measure it again and again in order to see whether the, 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 the situation changed or was it just uh, one measurement. But amongst the, the subgroups of the uh, Israeli Jewish public, we were really, really surprised to find out that over 90% of the ultra-Orthodox uh, uh, Jews said that they feel part of the state and its problems, because normally it would be less than 50%, okay? Because the state is mentioned here. And uh, we will uh, be again in the field in order to uh, measure that uh, in the future. And again, the same question is whether the phenomena changed the phenomenon is different, the, the attitude really changed, or is it just uh, uh, this specific measurement that came in a specific uh, 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 moment? Now, uh, we will also uh, talk about um, uh, how we, we asked, uh, when will life in Israel get back uh, uh, to normal? And uh, as you can see, people are quite optimistic. Uh, uh, most of them think that it's one uh, to two months or two to three months. Uh, and only 10% think that it will take more than a year to get back uh, uh, to normal. So uh, actually this explains their optimism uh, that we saw earlier uh, on. As for the... Um, um, relationship that I mentioned uh, before between various subgroups in uh, the Israeli public. We asked about Jews and Arabs. 57% of the entire uh, general Israeli public said that uh, uh, the relationship improved uh, during the corona uh, days. 51 said so about the relations between the public and the police, because the police was very active in the streets uh, during uh, the crisis. And then uh, we asked about the government, only 29% said that it improved, 60% said that they worsened. The same goes without, uh, regarding the relationship between the non-Haredim, uh, the non-ultra-Orthodox and the ultra-Orthodox, 62% said that the, uh, uh, the relationship became worse. What's very interesting is uh, that the lower number, the lowest number of those saying that there was any improvements in the relations were amongst the ultra-Orthodox themselves. They do not see much Im uh, improvement in the relations during uh, the corona days, and this is... Uh, very, very interesting, taken together with the fact that they said in huge numbers that they do feel part of the state uh, and uh, its problems. Now, what about the uh, uh, Palestinians? We asked about who, uh, they, this is three months ago, we asked who would manage the negotiations with the Palestinian better Netanyahu or Gantz. Uh, uh, amongst the right, uh, uh, there is a clear majority who are saying uh, um, Netanyahu. But on the center uh, and uh, 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 in the center and uh, on the left, there is no majority saying that Gantz will do it better. And as of today, probably uh, on the left, uh, the numbers uh, will go down. So on the average, uh, the preference for Netanyahu uh, to negotiate with the Palestinians, the majority is clearly there. Now, uh, we asked about uh, assisting uh, the Palestinian authorities to deal with the corona epidemic. 
in uh, the Palestinian, uh, Palestinian Authority controlled areas. And as you can see, the Jewish, uh, um, the Jew oh, no, you can't see, the Jewish uh, uh, sample was split, divided almost in the middle between those who said that Israel should assist and those who said that Israel shouldn't uh, uh, assist. Amongst the Israeli Arabs, of course, there was a huge majority saying, yes, Israel should, uh, Israel should uh, uh, assist the Palestinian uh, Authority. But uh, as I said, the Jews said half and a half. Half said no and half said yes. This is interesting, particularly in comparison to another question that we asked in the same uh, uh, poll regarding uh, um, the uh, assistance to the Hamas in return for a deal with Hamas about, uh, uh, this is by the way, uh, the division. As you can see, the ultra-Orthodox uh, were uh, the most uh, uh, in opposition to uh, the assistance uh, to the Palestinian Authority. Uh, my my uh, uh, slides uh, go very uh, slowly, so I don't know what uh, uh, will happen next. Okay. Support Israel giving humanitarian aid to Gaza to treat the coronavirus in, uh, in, the, um, in exchange for Hamas agreeing to deal uh, regarding the Israeli soldiers missing in action and hostage. On both the Jewish and the Arab uh, samples, we got almost 70, 70% saying yes, Israel should give humanitarian aid to Gaza. But what you should keep in mind is the second part of the question. This is not humanitarian aid when you're actually expecting a deal uh, to get back from the other side. So as the Palestinian uh, Authority apparently is not perceived as being uh, capable of giving anything to Israel, half of the Israeli Jews said, no, uh, we, are, we are not interesting, uh, interested in assisting them. However, as the Hamas has something that Israelis want, uh, they are ready to give assistance even to Hamas, uh, uh, which is considered here as the arch enemy of Israel. Now, uh, when we split uh, or segmented the answers by uh, uh, level of religiosity, we saw that there was hardly any differences between all the groups, the, the secular, the traditional non-religious, the traditional religious, uh, religious and ultra-Orthodox. Almost 70% in each uh, subgroup said, yes, we should get a deal with Hamas uh, in return, uh, give them some humanitarian uh, assistance. Now, um, this is my la last slide. Uh, we asked only two days ago, uh, to which extent do you support or oppose uh, annexation? And as you can see, very small support on the left, one third at the center, and 71% on the right. On the average, it is about 52% uh, um, in the entire Israeli Jewish public. This means that they actually have a slight majority in support for uh, uh, annexation. And uh, of course, uh, this is something that is well known uh, to the uh, decision makers. And it goes hand in hand uh, when we ask them uh, what rights should the Palestinians residing in uh, these areas, what should they get, what kind of, of status if uh, they stay in these annexed uh, uh, areas, the largest share said they shouldn't have any, any more rights that they have now. So they will be under Israel sovereignty, but the majority on the Israeli Jewish side uh, prefers not to give them anything uh, better than uh, the situation is uh, as of today. Uh, on the uh, uh, Arab-Israeli side, of course, the majority said grant them citizenship, full citizenship. So this is it, and I'm sorry for the slides. I don't know uh, what happened. Thank you. Thank you so much for that presentation. And Professor Tamar, we actually were at the end, we were showing your slides. Yochanan was able to, to troubleshoot that. Oh, so, okay. so everybody got to, to see that. And when we 
when we put this on our website, we'll also hopefully be able to include those slides as well so people can okay. analyze all that data that you, that you shared. And now I want to, for the remaining 15 minutes that we have, or a bit that we have right now, I want to encourage people, if you have a question, to put it in the chat box or in the Q&A. And as people do that, I actually have had a few that have come in already, and I would love to, to get some of those started for each of you. So, Yohanan, we'll start with you. A follow-up question for you is, why is Netanyahu focused on annexation? I wonder if something it's something his voters care about, but why is it at the top of his agenda? Like, I understand that it is something, but... Yeah, well, so far, and, and Netanyahu cared about annexation just before, before the election campaigns and not after. Uh, annexation was uh, uh, an illegitimate idea in Israeli public life uh, uh, since uh, the Six Day War, uh, now f almost 53 years ago, uh, we have, um, uh, we gain control over the West Bank and Gaza and the idea of annexation never, uh, was never brought forward seriously. And Netanyahu put it on the agenda back in 2015, just before the election, because his polls demonstrated that it's a good way to lure some votes from uh, Bennett's Jewish home party. And after the election, he dropped off this uh, idea and it, and it again resurfaced before uh, uh, the 20, uh, during the 2019 election cycles. What uh, uh, might have brought it back now in a more serious fashion are a number of reasons. Number one, obviously a US administration that is uh, 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 very favorable and enabling uh, uh, to push uh, uh, forward with this agenda. Number two, and Netanyahu uh, beginning to think about what kind of a legacy he uh, is going to leave. And that's uh, 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 something that uh, he, he thinks might uh, uh, be uh, under his name. And number three, since it's popular among his base, as Tamal just uh, demonstrated, it's always good to have this uh, as a, as a, as a tool to fire up one's base and to use it as a, as a wedge issue. So, you know, if, if we won't have any other better crisis to deal with or to shift the public's attention, this is always a, a good issue to use. So whether this tool will be used or not, and to what extent, we will only know within a few months. Thank you. A question just came in about the trial. So what does this new government mean for Netanyahu's trial? Well, now there's a justice minister who is com publicly committed to uh, protecting the independence of the judiciary and of the law enforcement institutions. Netanyahu's trial was uh, delayed by a couple of months uh, as a result of an emergency decree that was issued by his, a very favorable justice minister that he uh, appointed. Uh, it will no, not be extended anymore and the trial will not be interrupted and it will begin. And, uh, and since assuming this government will also be established, Netanyahu uh, will not have a dominant role in appointing the next state prosecutor and the next attorney general as he anticipated initially. And that's why we can uh, uh, safely assume that the, uh, uh, while Netanyahu will manage the affairs of state, he will also uh, have to uh, uh, defend himself and try to clear his name in, a, in, a, in an independent court system uh, that will treat him like uh, uh, any other uh, uh, Israeli citizen. Thank you. Um, and Tamar, a question for you. Um, you said that a large majority of Israelis think the corona crisis damaged relations with the Haredim. Is this counter to what we saw, such as the IDF being welcomed into Bnei Brak? And what do you think about those results? Well, there is the uh, short run and the long run, uh, of course. Uh, now, uh, in the short run, uh, the immediate uh, uh, expectation was that as we saw the police there and the military there, and people were actually very, very friendly towards them, and of course, the, the police and, and, and uh, the IDF uh, soldiers were very, very 
uh, positive in their ad relations uh, and very, very sensitive and culturally sensitive and what have you. So there were some expectations, even in the IDI, Yohanan, if you remember, that uh, from now on, it's a new era in the relationship uh, between uh, non-Haredim uh, and Haredim. And I have to really compliment... Well, Tamar, I was more Yohanan. cautious even in that discussion. That's what I was saying, <laughs> that, uh, that Yohanan was uh, much more cautious about it. And he warned us that we shouldn't be so... Uh, thrilled with what was happening uh, uh, on the ground that uh, the ultra-Orthodox are not going to change their attitudes about uh, uh, the state and the state representatives and the state agencies. And apparently when we conducted this survey two days ago and the corona crisis is now a bit over, or at least we hope so, and, and Nebrak is open and other neighborhoods are open, they are back almost to square one saying, no, well, there is no improvement in our relationship with uh, uh, the state and with other uh, segments of Israeli Jewish society. So this is quite disappointing, I must say. Now, the question is to which extent their exposure to the digital uh, media to the cell phones or uh, to the online uh, whatever, uh, will this uh, stay with us or are they going to, you know, go back to square one and leave all these devices aside once they do not need it anymore in order to deal with the uh, realities of the corona? Thank you, interesting. I'm jumping to a bit of a different type of question is, um, I guess, for Yochanan and also Tamar, who after September's election, the joint list made the unprecedented move of recommending Gans to the president. What happened to this relationship? Is he still committed to better integrating this sector? Well, this past year was uh, uh, quite uh, uh, eventful with respect to the relationship uh, with the political representation of the Arab minority and also political participation of, of the Arab uh, minority. Gantz, for the first time, uh, included them in the coalition negotiation. The, for the first time, they recommended uh, Gantz to the president. And, uh, and in many ways, if it weren't for the uh, uh, awakening, political awakening of the uh, Israeli-Arab minority, Netanyahu would have had uh, the much desired 61 and above seats for his block of right wing plus ultra orthodox and and the entire uh, uh, political landscape would have been very very different. Gans understands that he made uh, some I would say symbolic symbolically courageous uh, 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 steps because he understood that uh, uh, if he doesn't develop some kind of a a tangible relationship with the uh, representatives of the Arab minority, then uh, Netanyahu's uh, 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 close alliance with the ultra-Orthodox will always override the, and, 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 uh, and, and marginalize him. So he did that, and I think he understands that, uh, that uh, 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 this is important to preserve. Um, he's expected to nominate among his uh, quota an Arab minister, uh, and, and, and we're yet to see if it will be a prominent person and will uh, uh, make a significant difference. If I were in his shoes, I would also allocate to uh, the joint list uh, a chairmanship uh, uh, of one of the Knesset committees that is in my quota in order to nurture this relationship. Um, it's really uh, up to Mr. Gantz and his political skills to sort of preserve that relationship, although he's... Uh, in a national unity and in a government with Mr. Netanyahu. I think he understands the importance whether he will have the political uh, 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 skill and acumen, uh, it's yet to be seen. I'd like to add to that that the, uh, the majority of the Israeli Arabs are very disappointed with guns. Uh, they seem as uh, a person who betrayed their uh, goodwill. And uh, when we asked, uh, what do you prefer, uh, the upcoming government or new elections amongst the voters of the joint list, the joint Arab list? The majority said no elections. 
was just two days ago. So uh, they are not uh, happy with the, uh, the move that Gantz uh, did. Uh, they uh, consider his move uh, as involving their sacrifice uh, 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 in return for very little uh, from Netanyahu. They do not think that he's going to protect their rights or expand their rights or treat them better once he sits in Netanyahu's government. They are very, very disappointed with him. Mm. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and I, one of this, I believe, might be one of the last questions that we'll have time for. But um, to start with you, Professor Herman, is that you, you mentioned that Israelis seem to be feeling more optimistic about the economy as the health threat recedes. What do you think will happen to these numbers if their economic crisis deepens? And, but, and do you think the economic numbers justify this optimism? It's a few questions okay. in one. But. I'm a political scientist, not an economist, <laughs> but uh, my, uh, my expectation is that the economic crisis uh, will not deepen uh, in, in the foreseeable future and that the 27 point percent are just uh, 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 um, a transitory phenomena mm -hmm. and that uh, uh, quickly enough when all the uh, uh, schools and, and, and businesses and malls and uh, you name it, uh, open up, uh, then it will get back, uh, not necessarily to 3%, but 11% uh, is a, a good guess and 11% is something that the state can live in. I don't see a huge wave of uh, social protest coming, although more than half of our respondents uh, uh, answer mm -hmm. that they foresee something like uh, 2011 just around the corner. Okay, thank you for, for that, that thought. Um, and I wanna go to Yochanan and ask him in the last few minutes if you have any other comments to, to start closing us off from this, from this briefing. Well, uh, we, we discussed, uh, uh, you know, many of the challenges and the, and, uh, and, uh, and, and problems and, and wedges uh, within Israeli society, but there's, uh, you know, also room for optimism. Israel uh, managed to overcome this uh, uh, crisis uh, with extreme, with uh, extremely low levels of casualties. If we look uh, uh, comparatively, our public is. Um, is actually quite adept at uh, moving from emergency state back to uh, normality and forgetting everything, and 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 so are uh, our systems. We've we've gone through a, a, a political crisis and deadlock that has created much tension within Israeli society, and now that the two uh, uh, blocks or the main the, the leaders of the two blocks are coming together. It, it creates also an opportunity for Israelis to come together again. They decided in the coalition agreement to create in the cabinet some kind of a committee for a, 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 some kind of a bringing us together a committee, and it might turn into nothing, but it might actually, uh, it, it, some real content can be injected into it. And we have to remember that the differences, the ideological differences with, between Israelis are not uh, are not that great when we are we talk about issues of of, uh, of policy in many areas and uh, and when we look at public opinion there's uh, much potential for uh, reaching uh, broad understandings so I hope that this government after such a long crisis uh, will uh, manage to manifest this will of Israelis to go back to uh, normality and uh, and will take us uh, will allow us to climb out of this. Uh, a, a crisis and, 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 and discover the huge uh, uh, power that exists within our people. That's great, thank you. And I, I appreciate the optimistic message and outlook right at, at the end of this. Um, so we're just at time. So I wanna thank you so much, um, Professor Tamar Herman and Yochanan Pesner again for, for your partnership and for sharing all this information. I know things are changing Every moment, I feel like every time we have a, a webinar, we have one thought at the beginning when we first talk about what's gonna be presented and then the night before something happens and you're able to pivot and be so on top of it to share such timely information. So thank you for that. And I wanna wish everybody um, 
a, a good rest of your day and to please stay he healthy and well and hope to hope to learn with all of you all again very soon thank you thanks for having us Bye.